Uh, and welcome to the Property Council of Australia's Leaders in Lockdown event. I'm Ken Morrison. I'm the Chief Executive of the Property Council of Australia. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here this morning. I'm pleased to say we've got over 400 people joining us uh, for this event from right around the country. Awesome. Also joining me today are three industry leaders who are going to help us look into the future and understand what the opportunities and risks look like as we emerge from this COVID lockdown period. I'm joining you today from Sydney, which is a home of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. On behalf of us all, wherever we might be around the country, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of these lands and their leaders, past, present and emerging. Today's live stream is brought to you by JLL, one of the Property Council's most long-standing members. And we'll now cross to Queensland to hear from Stephen Connery AM, who is JLL's Chief Executive Officer, Australia New Zealand, and immediate past president of the Property Council of Australia. Well, thanks very much, Ken, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just say JLL is very happy to support, again, the Property Council uh, today and indeed uh, this event. Um, and it's, a, it's an event which I think covers some very important topics in, in what is still very difficult times for um, many businesses and for many people, most notably, of course, in uh, Victoria and ACT and, and New South Wales. Um, but it's never a time to stop learning. And I think we can learn a lot uh, from what is happening uh, around the world as we come out of this global pandemic um, and indeed the changing nature of property and the globalization of property uh, which is very exciting indeed. But of course, we can uh, learn a lot uh, in Australia and offer a lot to the world. And at JLL, we see that all the time. There's a lot that our industry uh, contributes to the sector around the world. It's a massive contributor, as everyone knows, uh, to the Australian economy. But the, the massive and mature and successful property sector, which we're all proud to be a part of, uh, I think can offer uh, a lot around the world. Um, and its leaders... Uh, in the property sector here in Australia are indeed some of the best in the world. And what a great pleasure it is to have three of our industry CEOs, indeed three of our board members of the Property Council are joining us today. Now to you, David and Tarun and Sophie, thank you very much for joining this session. I know that there's a lot that you can share from your journey, your leadership journey, but also uh, the important nature of leadership in particular over the past 18 months. And we're all very much uh, looking forward to the conversation which you will start today and participate in and the Q&A, which will, will also be a vital part of that. Uh, and to you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining uh, this important session. There's a small video we're about to show, um, which I think demonstrates the changing nature of property uh, around the world and how we can create uh, a better future via real estate. I'll hand that video over to you now. Thanks very much, Ken. When you think about the future, what does it look like to you? Flying cars? Living on Mars? Robots in charge? Is it somewhere we can travel and get together like we used to? Where we found innovative ways to protect our planet against climate change and found new skills to make a better future. That future is now. JLL has a huge role to play in being greener, healthier and inclusive. More than ever, the world needs JLL to shape the future of real estate. Companies need healthy and dynamic workplaces that put a human experience at their heart. Investors want greener, smarter assets and our communities need our support more than ever. JLL has ambitious goals, which we will achieve by working together. We are using technology and insights to turn new ideas into reality for our clients. No matter how big or small the ambition, there is no better time for us to shape the future of real estate than now. Are you up for it? Let's go. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Craig and the whole JLL team and for all the support that you provide to the Property Council 
uh, right across the country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the big shift is about to begin. Lockdown Australia has their roadmaps now to, to take us forward. Leaders in the non-lockdown states are grappling with how and when those jurisdictions will transition. Vaccines have been the game changer, of course, and the unvaccinated will lead the way out of this lockdown period. And business now has to work out how it will navigate this transition and what life will look like on the other side. Today's session is going to focus on the key questions that will define the new normal for the property industry. We're going to focus on the things that aren't clear, the known unknowns, and perhaps some of the unknown unknowns as well. The things will separate success from failure as the industry looks to a new phase of living with COVID as opposed to protecting ourselves against COVID. So let's bring our panel members up on the screen now and to help us understand uh, how our lead is preparing for the road out of lockdown, I'm delighted to be joined by David Harrison, who's a Managing Director and Group CEO of Charter Hall, and of course, the National President of the Property Council of Australia. Sophie Fullman is a Managing Partner of Real Estate at Brookfield, and is also the Property Council's National Vice President. And Tuan Gupta, who's the Managing Director and CEO at Stockland, and Tuan also sits on the Property Council's National Board. Uh, uh, before we jump into the panel discussion, if I can just remind all of our viewers that you can ask questions as well. Please use the chat function uh, and those questions will come up for me. I'll try to get through as many of those questions as we can. We've got a, a good amount of time, so I, I really want to draw on those as much as possible. David, uh, Sophie, Tarun, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us this morning and giving the, us the benefit of your time. Uh, Thank you, Ken. I, I thought we... We might start with the virus itself, the pandemic itself. And, uh, you know, because this phase we're going through now of coming out of lockdown is quite different from previous phases. Previously, success was zero COVID. And now we're going to be making a transition with lots of COVID in the community. And, and to it, I might start with you. You know, will this transition feel different? for the community and for business, do you think? And what will be the business implications? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I think it will be different, um, Ken, and you've really got to look uh, offshore for some of the indications of uh, what's to come ahead. I think at the onset, um, I should say, I think Australia is now caught up and now we, we are starting to trend at uh, global best practice. I think in the next four to six weeks, we will have one of the highest uh, vaccination rates in the country, which is just fantastic to see the community stepping up. So I think um, we were falling behind, but we've now caught up and we, we're now going to be in the lead pack. I think it will be different um, because um, I think as we as the conditions ease, um, it won't be a, you know just a straightforward everything back to normal. I think we're still in a period of transition over the coming months, uh, because I think uh, infections will spread. Um, you know, that's just uh, an undeniable fact of the virus, especially Delta virus, which means there will be more infections and potentially more stress on the medical system, the hospital system. And I think that's the thing that I'm sure the community and the our leaders and everyone will be watching. And that's what we need to keep our mind on, because Without public health, we will have, we won't have economic health. And I think that's something to watch. So we all have to ease into it. I think we've got to continue to practice COVID safety, social distancing, masks, and be very careful as we come out of it. But I think as you look beyond that into uh, calendar 2022, I think there's cause to be optimistic um, because um, if you look at uh, other countries, uh, yes, the virus is still spreading, but the fatality rate and serious hospitalization rates are now tracking at very low levels, similar to what we're seeing at the moment in Victoria and New South Wales. And I think clearly with that, uh, business conditions will uh, start to improve and, and we're anticipating that in, in the new year. But also yeah. with that, we we'll to get... Uh, obviously a lot of other things going, um, starting to open up like borders and state borders. 
So, so we'll come back to business conditions and some of those other issues you mentioned there, Tarun. Sophie, if you fast forward six months, uh, you know, what's the mindset, do you think? Are people, you know, hyper-concerned about COVID? Has it receded in the background? What, you know, what do you think that psychology looks like? Yeah, well, it, it's obviously hard to tell at this stage because in the world of COVID, six months is still a very long time away. Um, but as Tarun points out, you know, we will have the benefit here in Australia of some of the highest vaccination rates in the world. Um, and we should take enormous, you know, confidence from that. Um, I think that what that really means over the next six months and, and really more um, focused on the next couple of months is, is this gradual phase out, um, of, out of the lockdown and back to some, you know, path to, to normality or, or to new normal conditions. Um, I think in six months' time, you know, COVID will still be a prevalent risk. Um, uh, of course, that, that's only natural, but I think hopefully it will be receding um, as, as a risk, which probably means realistically that, a lot of the other risks that have been kind of put on the back burner or, or a little bit, you know, further down the list will start to become more prevalent too. And I think all of us as risk managers will need to be, you know, much more um, plural in, in managing COVID as but one of many um, different risks. But, you know, what, what we expect that really to mean at, at our properties and, and what we're already seeing in um, parts of the world that are a little bit ahead of us of coming out of lockdown is that, um, you know, safety and hygiene within buildings um, will continue to be very strong and important, as, as Tarun has pointed out. Um, but all of the obvious trappings of COVID will start to sort of fall away and recede. I think there'll probably be less stickers on floors, less signs, less hand sanitizer bottles all, all over the place. And a lot of that will be much more integrated into buildings. Um, and, you know, as, as owners, we will probably be more focused on activation, on encouraging and enticing people back into our buildings, our city centres, and getting them confident and comfortable um, with, with being there and, and enjoying the, the benefit of, of being together. Mm. David, uh, looking beyond this transition phase uh, and thinking about 2022 as hopefully a relatively sort of COVID lockdown free uh, environment, what, what's that economy look like? You know, what, what's the other side look like? Is it how bullish should we be about economic conditions here? <clears throat> look, it's a good question, Ken. As, uh, as Sophie alluded to, you know, six months in COVID is a long time. So trying to predict how things will look in, you know, December versus March versus June next year is, uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, I think overall, we, we have to accept, as Tarun says, that Australia has done pretty well. Yes, we're slow, but we've got ourselves to you know, best in class sort of vaccination rates globally. Um, and one of the things that's kept the Australian economy going reasonably well, obviously there's been a lot of government stimulus and I think the, the federal government has, uh, has done a couple of really smart things with JobKeeper and then Home Builder, et cetera, that has sort of allowed us to, uh, if you like, you know, move through a pretty severe lockdown period in your two biggest states. But looking forward to 22, um, Australia and the rest of the world are going to have to get used to a tapering of government stimulus. The governments can't keep, you know, pump priming the economy with handouts. So the what I call the natural unemployment rate will have to find its own level next year and, and the year beyond. So... That the question really is going to be, does the resurgence in consumption, um, and we all know that Australia's done well because we've had $20 billion of external consumption uh, going offshore pre-COVID that is, much of that has been sort of reinvested and consumed in Australia. The, the reality is when international borders open, there will be a, a release of some of that consumption externally. There will be uh, a need for corporate Australia to stand on its own two feet and, and therefore the employment level and, and where it, it gets rebased without direct, you know, stimulus uh, to, to the Australian population is the big unknown. Um, and whilst, you know, we're all seeing, you know, listed markets, uh, you know, sort of freak out a little bit around, 
you know, rising inflation and the big debate whether it's transitory or, or, or structural, um, you know, what, what the world is going to have to come to terms with is a period of, um, you know, being weaned off government stimulus. Is there sufficient rebound economically in each, in, in each jurisdiction? And, you know, from Australia's perspective, you know, we've seen a plummeting of prices in, you know, in our in our major commodity, which which is obviously, you know, going to have an impact on a on an economy that is a big exporter of iron ore and other commodities. Um, so, I think we we're looking at 2022 with quite a few uncertainties, but with cautious optimism that, um, you know, that the thing that's kept Australia going for a long time uh, is the fact that we actually produce. Uh, product that, that people want to buy, um, and then we'll talk about it a bit later. But the the you know sixty four dollar question really is you know what is the impact on you know a two year pause in net migration, and how long does it then take for that to, to come back to naturally provide support for the growth in the Australian economy? That they're the big issues that I think we're facing. So you just give me cautious optimism there, David, and then and, and sitting on the fence a lot with uh, some of that stuff. Tarun, what's your outlook? Do you, do you, you, uh, are you more bullish than David there? No, I think um, there, there is a few things to think about. I think you've got to go back to, uh, say, June when we weren't in lockdown across the country and you could see there were some really strong conditions across the board. I think today, even uh, in all the sectors we operate in, particularly residential, also retail, and you know where you see parts of the economy, there is some inherent strength in the economy. There is momentum. Clearly, Delta slowed that down. But I think as we come out of it next year, we should see some of that pent-up demand uh, starting to translate. I think longer term, though, eventually um, uh, the, the immigration question is very important because we already have skill shortages um, in many parts of the economy because state borders are shut and there are skill shortages. And um, as I said, uh, you know, you talk to any CEO in the industry, there are issues at play. And we have to ease that with the Im immigration starting to come back into national students. And I think that that is the big factor uh, beyond as you look i think we would we, we're likely to get a bounce in the first half of uh, 22 if you look at what happened uh, earlier this year but to sustain that economic growth we have to start to open our economy up uh, i think that that's a key factor in my mind otherwise economic growth will be constrained so if you Brookfield has the benefit of being part of a, a global business, what, what's, what's that perspective bring to this discussion about what the economic outlook looks like for Australia? Yeah, well, look, big picture, um, you know, our outlook is, is solid, solid and strong, uh, both locally in Australia as well as offshore. Um, I think when you look at the big drivers of long-term economic growth, um, and, and investment trends, the, the tailwinds are strong and, and very conducive for good conditions in the foreseeable future. Um, you know, we've obviously had a lot, the benefit of a lot of government stimulus, which has meant that there hasn't been distress, which is fantastic. As David said, you know, coming off that into, you know, a more open economy is obviously a big transition that, that um, probably will have some bumps along the way. But broadly speaking, you know, interest rates are at all time lows. Um, uh, you know, that, that is forecast to continue for, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, everywhere people are looking for, for yield and for income um, and, you know, the long-term sort of drivers of, of growth and, and themes that we're seeing here in our business in Australia are, are prevalent um, elsewhere offshore uh, even more so and they are, um, you know, increasing urbanisation, increasing densification and ageing population, um, globalization of, of students and, and of education um, uh, and, and all of that sort of set within the backdrop of, of an economy 
um, all around that, that is rapidly um, moving towards decarbonisation. So a lot of big tailwinds sort of um, at, uh, at, at the back of, of the property sector more generally, which I think is very conducive for, for growth. We've seen, you know, in, in economies um, here last year and, and elsewhere around the world in the last 12 months as we've come out of lockdowns, um, how strong things have bounced back. We expect that that should be um, the same here again, you know, discretionary spend um, picking up again, people now hopefully starting uh, to travel again soon. And to David's point about, you know, the, the sort of impact of um, commodity prices on, on our economy and, and, and how important they are to us, you know, once international borders reopen, then that should start again to provide the, the usual type of diversification of economic growth in Australia. We all know international students coming in is a big part of that tourism, is a big part of that travel services discretionary spend. They're all big parts of it. You know, commodity prices always go up and down and they've come off a bit, but they're also really, really high and much higher than anyone thought there would be three months ago so you know within the broad context of things um, the fundamentals are strong unemployment is low GDP growth is forecast to, to continue to remain robust um, and we don't expect globally there to be another synchronized shutdown which means that at all times even as we all come out of this and it probably will be choppy there will be big pockets of economic growth somewhere in the world that's driving you know broader um, economic activity and, and we think that you know Australia is well positioned to, to benefit from that. We simply made this conversation around uh, some of the challenging issues or things we don't know. David, you you flagged interest rates, uh, and you know pre Delta there was this growing talk that you know, central banks would start to move. What's what's your view on what we might see over the next twelve months? Uh, look, I, I think the long end of the curve will be pretty volatile. You know, if you look at during the course of calendar year twenty one. You know, we had a bit of hysteria with bond yields going towards 2%. I think they peaked at about 1.9. Then within three months, they dropped to 1.1%, now back around 1.5%. Um, the, the reality is that the long end of the curve will be volatile, the short end of the curve. And I'll make the point that at the short end of the curve, the vast majority of small businesses are funding at the short end of the curve. You know, Sophie or Tarun or, or, or us at Charter Hall might you know, have, uh, you know, sophisticated long-term hedging strategies that, you know, try to um, sort of align our hedging maturity with sort of, you know, lease maturities. But at the consumption level, the, the short end of interest rates, you know, the 90-day bill rate is really what the fundamental cost of debt is for uh, businesses that want to, you know, borrow to invest Um and, and similarly, in the housing market, and Australia has always benefited from, you know, a strong housing market, they're still at record low uh, rates, whether you, you're floating or locking in sort of fixed, fixed interest rates. So I think, you know, central banks around the world, uh, not, notwithstanding the, uh, the, 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 what we think will be a relatively short-term rise in inflation, will be very cautious about overreacting. As I said earlier, you're going to have this COVID hangover of uh, economies having to stand on their own two feet without government handouts. And in that environment, central banks are going to need to be really cautious about going too, too hard too early um, on raising interest rates in response to short-term inflationary spikes. So our view is that it, it is transitory. There are definitely signs of inflation. Yeah, let, let's face it. You know the the um, you know the 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 cost of any sort of shipping has gone through the roof. You know, cost of steel, concrete is all rising. But as I said earlier, let's see how things pan out over the next twelve months to see whether that inflation is more long term. Um, and in that environment, I think, as Sophie alluded to. Uh, the outlook for real assets uh, and in investing in growth assets is pretty good. Let's, let's have no illusions. We still have one of the largest spreads of cap rates and, and internal rates of return to the 10-year bond yield that this country has ever seen. So, yes, everything's come down. Um, but, you know, if you're a mum and dad investor and you can invest in, you know, unlisted property funds or listed property funds giving you a 5% dividend yield looks a lot better than sort of 0.2% in the bank. So I think there's going to be money. Um, and as I said that, you know, as you know, Ken, there's been a very big 
jump in net household savings because people haven't been con consuming. Um, so I think as confidence uh, emerges and as we sort of emerge out of lockdowns, um, the environment for, you know, sort of investing is going to be okay. Um, I'm not seeing, you know, great booms in front of us, but I'm also not seeing, you know, a sort of pullback in, in, in asset pricing simply because I think uh, the, the environment's pretty conducive. Okay, thanks, David. Let's, let's come back to some of the issues that uh, were flagged a bit earlier. And the return to office and CBDs is clearly a big thing on everybody's mind, both because everybody's got teams and need to work out what to do with in those lockdown cities, uh, but also it's a huge part of the business. Uh, Sophie, uh, office is a huge part of the Bookfield business. You know, what's your, what's your thinking as how this will roll out in Australia? What's your expectations? For, for return back to office. For return back to office and, yeah. and you know, and, and I guess, you know, what's that trajectory look like? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what do we learn? Like, where do we end up? You know, there, I mean, there was any number of people who were, who were riding the end of the office building, the end of the CBD. That's clearly not going to be the case. But, but what, what do you think that transition? And then when, when do we end up? Where do we end up? Yeah, look, it'll obviously depend city by city and, you know, as government restrictions um, allow people to come back in a safe and measured way. Um, and that's obviously going to fall at a time of year when a lot of people are um, going to have breaks over Christmas and summer holidays. So I expect over the next three to six months, it is going to be fairly patchy. Um, but I think, you know, that it's sort of with, with the confidence of the benefit of a huge amount of our population having been vaccinated, there's an enormous opportunity for all of us in the property industry um, as, as owners of real estate and as operators of real estate to, to instill confidence in the ways that we can safely go back um, to our properties and to our cities um, and to engage with each other and, and with all of the things that we've enjoyed doing um, in, in those cities. Um, up until now, it's, a, it's an important part of um, many of you know, our corporate cultures to, to be together. It's certainly been part um, uh, of, of our corporate culture. We're looking forward to being back in the office whenever it is that that's allowed. Hopefully that'll be fairly soon in Sydney. Um, uh, but we think it's important to open, uh, you know, when, when conditions are, are allowed to, to have people to come back so that we can work together. And, and, you know, for mental health reasons, a lot of people have been locked down for a long period of time and enabling them to come back and work in a different place, I think is important. Um, equally, um, just supporting the retailers that have been doing it very tough in the city for a long time is, is important. Um, and, and again, instilling confidence more broadly is, is an opportunity for all of us. And for us, what that means is that, um, you know, we'll have very bespoke activation and reopening plans by building. Um, you know, they vary, again, depending upon where each city is in its reopening plan, but broadly, they will be focused on moving our marketing budget um, to, you uh, basically um, supporting our retailers to the benefit of our occupants. Um, you know, we, we sort of look to the property council's very robust research that shows that, you know, location and amenity and, you know, building qualifications are all well and good. But the thing that most people like when they come back to an office is food. <laughs> and so, you know, we'll be working with our tenants to, to give people free coffees and warm donuts and beautiful bunches of flowers when they walk in the front door to activate and remind people how good it is to be back as soon as it's safe um, to do so, obviously, um, and in line with government restrictions, but really, you know, using that to, to change um, people's patterns of behaviour and, and to enable us all to, to get out and about. So we're, we're really looking forward to that. And I think it'll be, you know, over, over the next couple of months that that, that, that starts to occur. Um, we should all expect that it will probably be a little bit lumpy and a little bit choppy. Um, you know, as Tarun alluded to at the beginning, probably a re-emergence out of lockdown, even at these high levels of vaccination, isn't going to be perfect. It isn't going to be beautifully linear. So we all need to be ready to sort of work in a period of uncertainty and sort of experiment with what, what what does and doesn't work, but all to the end of, you know, getting people back and getting people comfortable with uh, with normality. And the, the end game there, what, what's the end game, you know, do you, do you look and think that, okay, there is going to be less space required from tenants? Are they going to be looking to pay less because they're going to have less of their people in, in there in a, you know, any given day of the week or... You know, or do you think it will just normalise out or perhaps some of that pain will be 
you know, for lower quality building stock rather than from than some of the, the high quality building stock. How do you see that, that economic dynamics landing? Yeah, look, big, big picture, and this holds true for Australia as well as what we're seeing all around the world in the big office markets where we play, is that, you know, people are not changing their overall demand for office space, they're changing the way that they like to use it. Um, obviously, each company will be different um, and adoption of hybrid or working from home or working from anywhere models will, will depend company by company. But, you know, overwhelmingly what we're seeing, and I think, you know, in Australia on the East Coast, what the last couple of months has demonstrated to most companies is the importance of physical space uh, where people can work together. Um, so net net, we don't see that that will um, result in a reduction in demand for office space. It'll probably result in a change of the proportion of you know dedicated single desk space to collaboration space. People want more personal space when they come to the office, albeit that maybe they won't come every single day. Um, you know, when they come, they want good amenities, they want good quality, they would want a good operator, um, they want great breakout and collaboration space. Um, but you know, globally, we're not seeing um, any overarching net pullback in demand, albeit that, you know, markets are, um, you know, obviously different, uh, different all over. You know, one good example that I would give is, um, you know, again, Google in uh, New York, who's just this week announced that they're buying, you know, um, an enormous building there that they occupy, that they're one of the tenants that is most able to and has been most encouraging of, of its people to work, work remotely throughout this entire period. But they see the long-term importance of physical space, of being in a great city to attract and retain the type of talent that they need to grow their organisation. And their organisation is growing at a massive rate. So some, you know, some companies will be contracting, um, but as usual, like we're in a different time of economic cycle, an enormous amount are, are expanding and are seeing you know, office and, and physical presence as, as an essential tool um, of their corporate culture and organisational structure. David, what are you saying to investors when investors are asking you that question? You know, what, what does office look like in six or twelve months' time, from an investment dynamic point of view? Uh, well, you know, what I'm saying to investors and what investors are saying to me are very similar. Um, the, the reality is that uh, whilst industrials got all the headlines. Uh, in the last couple of years, you know, the, the demand for office investment assets is very strong. We've had plenty of sales evidence and, and price discovery of office assets that uh, range from, you know, half empty buildings to, you know, fully leased buildings. So I, I think the, there is going to continue to be a strong conviction from investors for, for office assets uh, as uh, Sophie alluded to, I think there is generally consensus that net net demand's not going to change, and that's a combination of uh, higher workspace ratios, almost the reversal of the trend we saw for the last seven years on activity-based working. Very few companies I'm talking to are uh, uh, going to, you know, continue with that philosophy. Um, I think that might change. So as we go through a couple of years of living with COVID in the community and it, you know, it almost hopefully becomes like the common cold. Um, I think the, you know, that, that may change, but I think what COVID has definitely done, uh, once again, as Sophie alluded to, tenants need to create collaboration space, amenity. A lot of our large tenants are creating all sorts of internal uh, sort of kitchen and dining facilities for you know, their, their staff, you know, you, you, so if you mentioned Google, I've been to, you know, a lot of these big global tech companies are around the world and, you know, the, the, you've, you've got whole floors uh, that are dedicated to essentially internal kitchen and diving, dining services just for, you know, staff and visitors of, of these major uh, customers. So, and if you look at the pre-leasing we've done during COVID in the last couple of years uh, where we've virtually pre-leased about, you know, 100,000 square metres of uh, new office space uh, that is now under construction. That tells you that major tenants from government to corporates are looking through COVID and saying, we, you know, we need to plan for uh, a return of our workforce into the office environment. I, I don't think the, the flex will be any different to the flex being offered to, you know, uh, employees prior to COVID. Um, and I think what 
particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, this second lot of lockdowns in the, the back half of this year probably has accelerated the desire to get back into the office environment. Uh, you know, we, we had an Exco meeting yesterday and I warned everyone, you know, from, you know, the 25th of October onwards, you know, virtually, you know, one or two out of the five day week, expect all your people to be out to lunch because they're going to be wanting to get back and collaborate with colleagues, customers. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think that part of working in CBDs and working in an office environment is the bit that has been massively missed by uh, the, the Australian population. And therefore, I think we are going to have a strong demand of, of, of occupier demand, um, sort of re-entry, both office densifications within our customers and the customers looking to sort of move forward. And the last thing I'd say, there is no doubt COVID has accelerated the bifurcation of tenant demand for new buildings, the very best in health and hygiene. You're going to have very good buildings that are going to have to undergo massive transformation for them to compete with what a brand new building can uh, provide. And, and Sophie and Tarun and, uh, and, and, and myself, we've all got two hats to wear. wear. We're, we're planning or building brand new buildings, but we also have to deal with the fact that we've got existing stock that has to be brought up to, you know, the standards that I think the, you know, tenant customers are going to demand going forward. So, Tarun, you're someone who thinks deeply about the way our cities are shaped. The In terms of distribution of work, do you think COVID alters that? Do the CBDs play a bit less of a jewel in the crown role than what they have in the past? Or do we go back to those being the... Um, you know, the drivers of the crucible of job creation in our, in our metropolitan areas? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I'd say I agree with Sophie and David on some of the thematics for working, but I think we've got to acknowledge we're not going back to 2019. I think fundamentally how we work and how we use technology and working from home uh, in our view, are uh, fundamental changes that are taking place. And out of that will come, um, I think, different forms of, uh, you know, winners and losers. And I think David alluded to that. For, for us, I think the way we're thinking, we don't have a lot of existing stock, but we're designing new, a uh, couple of big uh, new buildings here in Sydney. And I think the curation of the workplace, if you use that word, word I think workplace will need to be much more heavily curated uh, to attract uh, people to come in uh, for all the reasons of culture and ideation and team building. But I think working from home and working flexibly uh, is going to endure. Um, we were uh, even before you know this latest lockdown, just in our own uh, work, you know, in our own team. We were getting about, and we, we have a complete flexible policy even before COVID came. We were getting about 70% of our people coming in um, three to four days a week. And then the rest, they were working from home or using the time flexibly. I think that flexible working and hybrid working is going to endure. I think within that, there is um, going to be redistribution to some extent. I think in the short term, um, there will be this flight to quality. But I think um, if you look back 10 years ago, uh, when the Green Revolution started, uh, if you remember, there was this real resurgence of uh, buildings chasing and wanting to become more environmentally sustainable. You had this real, it actually helped the sector because we had to all refit our existing buildings, invest in green technologies and new buildings came which were more resilient. I think we are at the start of something like that in the office market where our existing buildings will, be need, will need to be repurposed. There'll be CapEx required, repositioned, as I said, curated in a different way to attract people to come back into our CBDs. And then there will be some buildings, some locations that just re lead to obsolescence. I think that, that, that'll start to take place. But within that lies opportunity to create a new workplace. And, Long term, we believe, I think um, I, I concur with Sophie and David, workplace has a fundamental, uh, you know, going to the office has a fundamental place 
in how corporations and companies and organizations uh, thrive and how we as humans interact. But I think there's going to be quite significant redistribution within that. Mm. And can I ask you then the same question about around housing? Do you, 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 the, we have there's a lot of people who have written a lot of assuming that the transitional housing preferences that people have, have expressed as we've gone through lockdowns will stay. So, so what sticks and what doesn't? I'll start with you two, and then I'll get perspectives from from Sophie. David. Yeah, there's, um, I'll, I'll give you the long, long view. Our long view is still urbanization of the big cities continues for all the reasons that humanity has been attracted to big cities, which is over the last 200 years, in fact, for thousands of years, uh, because you have greater opportunity, greater talent attraction and, um, you know, great, greater really chance to grow, grow in those environments. But I think in the short to medium term, suburbanization is the key trend at the moment. And obviously we are playing in a big way in that. And what we are seeing is um, that the requirement for more space, because we are all working from home and likely to work more from home. As I said, I think there are some fundamental changes there are at play. So people are seeking a different living uh, option. Uh, we're seeing in, in Australia about 20% of our buyers incrementally are now coming from middle rings looking to move out. And uh, the latest release we did only a few weeks ago here in Ilara, um, we had 31 um, um, lots going, sold out or registered 502 two minutes, and 23 of those were upgraders looking to move out from 10, 15 minutes inside the city uh, sorry, in, in the middle ring to the outer ring. So they're trading commute of that extra 10 minutes for better amenity because you're getting another extra bedroom, you're getting better community facilities, brand new home. So that, that trend is at play and it's likely to be also at play at higher and medium density where you need extra space to, to, to work from home and to have a you know better better experience at home. So... So that's definitely happening. Um, I think the big question, the bigger question over the five-year outlook is we have really at the moment pent up demand and under supply. As I said, we've got very strong demand continuing to come through, but that's feeding of the immigration that came three years ago. As we know, immigrants buy at about after three years in being in the country. And we're still enjoying that because they get jobs, they save a deposit, and then get the conference to buy. Sometime next year, in the next year, and we're into 2023, that trend will stop. So when the new immigrants come, I think as a nation, we've got to think about how do we get them back into the housing market? What will that do to rental markets? Because they still need a roof over their head. So build to rent, single family, multifamily rental. Well, are they the uh, housing type that meet that demand when it comes? So. I think there's quite a few factors, but um, but I think the trend of suburbanization will stick, but urbanization is the long-term trend. I think the regional uh, migration, net migration is happening, clearly highest in many, many decades, but it's still a fraction of what actually goes into the big cities. Mm. Sophie Bookfield's a huge investor in built to rent around the world. Uh, you know, that, that is predicated on the, the premium for urbanisation and, and well-located. What, what does that equation look like in Australia post-pandemic, do you think? Yeah, well, I, th I think it becomes even more interesting. Um, you know, much of what Tarun was um, touching on is the matter of affordability. Um, you know, which has become even more problematic in Australia as a result of the big increase in house prices over the last 18 months. And, and that's a global phenomenon as well. So, you know, more and more people need a whole lot of other different ways, alternative types of accommodation. Um, so built to rent is an interesting sector. Um, uh, you know, other other sort of land lease communities like, like Stockland has been um, active in, you know, are, are the types of businesses that we're very active in in other parts of the world, again, to address, you know, affordability matters. Um, you know, different, I, I think affordability and also community are probably two of the big um, sort of themes that have come out of uh, the last two years, or at least have been even more um, exacerbated as a result of, 
uh, of the pandemic, uh, meaning that people need um, different types of alternative accommodation, um, whether they be renters, whether they it's be student accommodation, whether it be you know people living in uh, in you know micro living circumstances for a short period of time until they can work out where it is that they're ultimately going to um, to, to move. Um, and, and, you know, the importance of people uh, living in areas where they feel connected, um, a sense of community, potentially a sense of um, protection and, and being looked after, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that theme is something that we're seeing very much in our seniors living business in, in Aveo, um, where, you know, not only the strength of the um, housing market uh, is, is seeing a lot of new inbound inquiry, but also I think that the impact of lockdowns and the increased isolation of many people um, in an ageing demographic has meant that they're drawn even more to, to communities. So, you know, I think they're the types of um, trends that we're sort of seeing more immediately and that, and that we're playing in uh, and would expect to play in very much um, in, in the years ahead here in Australia. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of really echo uh, to Run's comments, though, that, that the long-term trend is clearly towards urbanisation. You know, that's, that's been happening for, for centuries, frankly, um, for all the reasons that we know that cities are great and wonderful places to be and, and for many parts of the world, just simple economic imperatives. Um, you know, I think, it, I think the statistics are that a, a city of a million people is forming every week. Um, so, you know, that, that's not something that's going away. And so there's an enormous opportunity to come up with a whole lot of different alternative product types to cater for many different parts of the, um, of the housing market. Got our, thanks, Sophie. We've got questions coming through, which is great. And David's been multitasking, answering a few of those on the chat, which is, uh, thanks, David. The, um, David, uh, to ruin Ray's issue of international borders and net overseas migration, I mean, this is another big challenge for the country, isn't it? And, um, uh, it, you know, what, how important is getting that right and restarting that natural growth engine for that uh, economic environment that um, you were describing at the start of the discussion? Oh, look, I, I think it's um, the statistics don't lie. If you look at the economic growth of Australia, you know, being one of the few economies in the world that hadn't had a recession since 1991, it was all because of net migration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't take out, you know, 200 to 300,000, you know, population growth each year and, and sort of think that the economy is not going to be impacted. So I think it's, um, you know, when you think about net migration, uh, and as Tarun said, yes, there's a delay before they start buying houses, but they're still renting. Uh, they're still consuming. Um, they're providing uh, a solution to our skill, uh, skill trade shortage uh, or skilled, uh, work for, skilled workforce shortage. Um, as we know, uh, many of the people employed in hosp hospitality have come from, you know, net migration. And if you talk to anyone in hospitality, they are having real trouble um, finding, you know, uh, labour. So I think as we hopefully, the, every state in Australia gets uh, used to the fact that we have to live with COVID and the whole 2020 thesis of eradication is, I think, well and truly dead. Um, we are going to need to, uh, you know, as an industry, um, you know, work with the government to, you know, uh, try to see, you know, borders open up. Uh, I think it's essential to the future of Australia to get back to a sensible net migration uh, policy. I think what's happened in the last two years, all this fear mongering around, oh, net migration is taking jobs for Australians has disappeared because, you know, the, the, there are jobs that we can't fill. Yeah. And, you know, I think the hysteria out of that whole debate is, is hopefully gone. I think we will get a bipartisan uh, approach to, you know, a, a need to um, reinvigorate um, net migration. And let's face it, if, if you know, double vax people are going to be jumping on planes to go overseas in, before Christmas, before you can fly to Perth, well, you know, that says a lot about, you know, what, we need to do in terms of you know opening up the the borders not only to um you know tourism and and business traveling but also you know to get net migration going again and as tarun said 
don't underestimate the need for this country to reinvigorate, you know, student, international students coming in. Uh, you know, it's become very competitive. There's a lot of countries in the world that are competing with Australia for, for foreign students. And we need to get that going again because, you know, they do, they do consume, you know, many of them, you know, do bring in, whether it's, you know, parents or grandparents capital to invest in the economy. Um, and I think, you know, that that's going to be critical. So there, it's not about if, Ken, it's about when and, and when you can see that sort of reopening. And as I said before, you know, my view on the various, you know, uh, COVID hangover issues, and Tarun mentioned a really good one about the lack of net migration and the fact that we're not going to have, you know, housing demand from, you know, you know, for a couple of years because of this two-year pause. We, we need to come up with other ways to sort of reinvigorate the, um, you know, the potential fall in growth. So I, I think I think the government, all the governments understand it's pretty critical, but it, I think it will be very important that the Australian population embraces the re introduction of sort of net migration targets so that we can um, you know, continue, continue to see the prosperity that Australia has seen for the last 30 years. Very important issue. I'd like to change tack a little bit. And, you know, we've been through this extraordinary period uh, and it's been an extraordinary time to lead an organisation. And I'm interested in your you know, reflections on what you've seen your organisations do that you really want to capture, that you don't want to give away in terms of the um, the ability to deal with you know, rapidly changing circumstances. You know, what, what, what's what's something that's you know that you've seen which has come out of the pandemic, which has been good or positive that you want to bottle? Sophie, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I would say you know the sort of many of the cultural attributes that, that have always been present at our firm have come even more to the fore um, over the last eighteen months. You know, teams coming together in, in a moment of crisis. I think what's been you know, particularly helpful is um, just broad transparency um, to, to people, you know, nationally as well as globally about what we think is happening and what we can see. Um, uh, you know, the sort of insight of the firm more broadly over many decades of investing and seeing many different crises and cycles, you know, gives at least confidence that um, whilst we hadn't been through a pandemic before, we'd been through different acute um, shocks. Um, and, and got through them and sort of, you know, giving people confidence about, about the way forward and that what we're going through at the moment, you know, isn't um, something that will be enduring for, for always. Parts of it will, for sure, but, you know, just having that sort of perspective. Um, you know, I think within all of that as well, what's, what's been particularly um, sort of powerful about uh, the, the recent experience is that it is two things, really, that, that have come to the fore and have been... Um, exacerbated or enhanced as a result of the, this experience. One, one is sort of a focus on um, social infrastructure and, and the importance of communities. And the other is um, individuals and, and the fact that we're all people at the end of the day and the human side of work and of looking after each other um, and almost the sort of celebration of, of diversity and, and of each of us having a unique perspective. That's been enhanced, obviously, by the fact that we've been all looking at each other in, in their own homes, in, in our living rooms and so on, and, and everyone has been dealing with their own juggle. Um, and what's that, what that has meant for us as an organisation, I think, is um, something sort of highlighting the importance of something that we were already paying a lot of attention to, which is diversity and inclusion. Um, really celebrating, you know, the importance of having diverse workforces, working with people in ways that um, will attract and retain people for really long periods of time during their career um, and, and recognising all of the different things that people, you know, are dealing with um, uh, in, uh, you know, in their lives and, and sort of recognising that. Um, and, and I think, you know, as we all come back to the office as, as patterns of work sort of normalise more and more, um, you know, there will be much greater focus on the emphasis uh, of sort of great communities of, of people coming together um, and, and of having, you know, diverse and inclusive um, patterns of, of work, um, sort of both, both from a behaviour point of view and, and an organisational point of view. And I think that's really, really encouraging. And, and this experience has sort of just elevated the, the conversation on that. Um, and that's obviously something that investors globally are, are wanting to see as well. Um, so I think it really goes hand in hand with that sort of societal um, shift more broadly. Dave, what about you? What, what, what's the, what's the, the, the positive learnings from COVID for you? Um, look, there's, there's two or three uh, 
uh, things that have been really important to our business for 30 years, you know, um, and we, all, and we all love alliteration. So, you know, people, partnership, property have been sort of really important for us. Um, and, and when I say people, it's not just our people, it's the people that work with in our customers. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, we've had a couple of very strong, consistent themes um, in our business around resilience and growth. And I think stakeholders have typically seen that resilience as being resilience of our investment portfolio and the returns for our, our investors. But in reality, what has been most remarkable to me is the resilience of our people over the last two years. You know, the, um, you know with, we, we went through a really tough 2020, um, but the rest of the country other than Melbourne sort of pulled out of it. You know, we were debating before Christmas, do we have a Christmas party? You know, our executive said that just is not okay when Melbourne's in lockdown. So we took a view that, you know, it's we're all in it together. So for me, the, the most remarkable thing about the last couple of years has been the resilience of our people. And then the other thing that I've, I think all organisations, but particularly ours has seen is, We'd always been customer centric because our whole balance sheet is co-invested with our uh, investors in our funds and partnerships. And, and so we've been a fiduciary of other people's capital since formation or founding 30 years ago. Um, I think what's happened, COVID has made our people dig deeper into the, the, the what's really driving the people they deal with with our customers, whether they're tenants and investors. And they've got to know them more deeply. As Sophie said, we get a visibility into everyone's living rooms and bedrooms sometimes. Um, YouTube has actually caught a few uh, inappropriate uh, videos that none of us need to repeat. But um, the, the reality is that I think um, this has made, uh, you know, people who are managing uh, customers more empathetic and, and more deeply ingrained in understanding a customer's business. So in, in many ways, I think it's helped us bring us closer to our customers and not just about um, the, the particular deal at the time, whether it's a lease or you know an acquisition or whatever, it's actually more about what's really driving them personally, what's driving their business. Can we understand more about your business other than just doing a deal? Um, so they're the things that I think you know, when I look back, if there's, if we want to look at silver linings, um, that th they have helped mature our organisation um, and, and its people and its and our people's connection with the the people that we deal with with customers. And you know, at the end of the day, um, that's got to be a good thing longer term. Thanks, David. And to run with one minute to go, what's your perspective? You've obviously straddled two organisations through COVID, and you taking over an organisation in lockdown? You know, what, what's your leadership lessons from this period? Yeah, I, I still, I think I had two weeks in the office and since then it's been leading from Zoom. Uh, but uh, I think rather than talk about me, I think um, for, for the organisation, I think how we work, the positives I think, um, which have been touched on, but I want to raise one more, is I think uh, our well-being and mental particularly our mental health and conversations in the organizations about, you know, looking out for each other and that culture of care. At least that's what I've observed here at Stockland. It's very strong. And we've been able to have much more open conversations on a regular basis about how important it is that we look after not just physical well-being, but our mental well-being and how leaders, managers are now starting to, and of course, teams and communities, really investing in that conversation, because I think that has led to the fact that in a one in 100 day event, we are still showing resilience, although it's uh, obviously having big impacts. I think that's a great thing and that that's come out of this at a, at a different level to what we, it used to be before COVID. I think the other one which Sophie touched on, I think, the taboos or resistance on flexible working and you know you can't have productivity if you're not in the workplace 
I think those have been broken because we have shown that teams and roles can be very productive and individuals can be very productive by adopting flexible uh, working styles that work for their life stage and, and where they are in their own journey. I think that should endure going forward because that builds diversity in inclusive workplaces and, and I think that's good for the community. And then the last one I think is, uh, which has probably dawned in more recent times is that uh, at the end, it's about relationships and that that's what I'm missing. Uh, you know, you can't build relationships on on Zoom. So we have to get together as humans to get back in, 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 in our communities, get back in the workplace, build relationships, have that social interaction. And I think that's what builds, uh, builds our well-being and prosperity. So I think that will override many of the challenges when we get back out next year, uh, out, out and about. And I think that that's what people are looking forward to. Well, that's a great place to leave the conversation um, to, to Tarun, Sophie, to David. Thank you very much for joining us. For all our viewers out there, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, for this live stream event. A couple of short messages before we, we do close out. Uh, you might have seen that we've moved our Congress to March next year. Uh, the event, I'm pleased to say, is sold out. But for the first time in Property Congress history, we're offering some live stream tickets. So please get on the website to have a look at those. You'll be able to access key parts of the program through, uh, through that Congress event. We've also got lots of other online events happening around the country in coming weeks. Keep an eye out for our live stream update on Friday morning, which, keeps, uh, which includes all the details. Thank you very much for tuning in and joining us this morning. Have a lovely day.